Tonight, from confronting coronavirus to raising standards and securing funding, there are huge challenges facing our schools. Teachers are under pressure, students underperforming. Screens are taking over and now there are even problem parents to deal with. You've got the questions, now let's get you some answers. Welcome to Q&A. Good evening. Joining us tonight, she left a top Melbourne grammar school to finish her studies in the public system, Year 12 student, V Tran. His career spans five decades and he doesn't mind putting parents back in their box, school principal, John Collier. He's been called the Kim Kardashian of maths teaching. Yeah, yeah apparently he travelled here on the bus with his students tonight. It's Eddie Wu. Uh, ducks of her school and a self-described nerd, Shadow Minister for Education, <laughs> Tanya Plibersek. And he's gone from handing out funding to schools as a Nationals Minister to advising how it should be spent. Director of the Gonski Institute, Adrian Pickley. Please make them all feel welcome. Well, you can stream us on iView and YouTube and join in on Facebook, Twitter and the Gram. Quanda is the hashtag. Please wash your hands before you touch any devices. Our first question tonight comes from Harry Cedar. Recently, we've seen a number of schools shut down for a day in response to the coronavirus threat, allowing time for a containment strategy to come into place. Now, if um, in the coming weeks, if the situation worsens, do you think our high schools are prepared with the uh, knowledge and resources to facilitate online learning? for as long as this epidemic lasts? And how might this affect Year 12 students down the line during trials if physical exams at the time are out of the question? Eddie Wu, are any of your students panicking yet? I wouldn't say panicking. We're really grateful to have fantastic support around us. That means, even though we know this is, in some ways, for this generation of students, quite unprecedented. Harry, it wasn't that long ago that you were in Cherry Technology High School, and you know, <laughs> um, thankfully, we have a lot of great support underneath any student who is away, even, you know, coronaviruses aside, when they're representing the school, when they're engaged in different excursions. Um, that's one of the great reasons why technology is powerful to help. But are you telling students that are in their final year that they have to be realistic, maybe? things will be disrupted? Disruption's already begun. I don't live that far from Epping Boys, which of course was closed for a short amount of time. So we know that there's real disruption, of course. And to be fair, this is something which is not new, just the scale of it is a little bit different. Um, when I was going through my HSC, my mum was going through her final year of life fighting with lung cancer. That was pretty disruptive too. What's really important is that for each of the different cohorts, for each student, we're providing things like technology to support the learning that's happening. And what's really important for every HSC student here to remember is that while, of course, there are really important stakes, uh, this is one milestone among many, and that continued learning, more so than what happens in one particular final exam, that's the part that matters. V, are you worried? Are your friends worried? Um, personally, I think that we should be putting students' health at first, obviously, but I am a bit worried with, obviously, how is it going to logistically happen? and if schools don't actually have the technology or the funding to actually fund online learning, then what's going to happen to their schools? And we definitely need to consider different ways to actually support them. John, uh, I know you said to me that there's a range of views within your school about how acutely this needs to be dealt with. There is a range. Some people are quite concerned, some aren't concerned at all. Schools like mine, I'm sure all schools are trying to be responsible to keep up to date with the health warnings, to be agile but not to overreact. So in my school we have a crisis team. We're actually meeting again tomorrow morning and we're testing our IT systems because we expect we may need to do online delivery. And if that happens, I think that curriculum authorities will need to look at what latitude they can give to actually put the interests of students first because that's what schools are about. We're about looking after our students. So we will get through this, but there may be some disruption along the way and schools will deal with that as best as they can while looking after their students. The Chief Medical Officer says they're looking at this 14-day isolation period. Yes. Does that duration present schools particularly with a problem? It is a long period of time and no clear indication of whether it's actually the right length. Yes, there's no clear indication and because coronavirus is obviously a novel virus, it's new, uh, we're responding to the medical situation as that develops. 
We had uh, a paediatrician in today speaking to our senior students and the medical profession too is trying to cope with this to learn as it goes along. So I think it's important to be agile and to support our students as best we can. All right. Our next question tonight is a video question from Emma Ritchie in Clayton, Victoria. Hi, my name is Emma. I am a teacher and I and many others I know have been threatened and abused by students and parents. I've read repeatedly in the media that it is the teacher's fault for lowered student outcomes while we stay up late marking and preparing engaging lessons for the kids. We also regularly have, our, have people demean our job and teachers are leaving the profession in large numbers. Do you think that teachers will function better and students will achieve better outcomes if teachers feel safe, supported and respected at work? John Collier. There can only be one answer to that question, and it is that if teachers are supported and valued, of course they'll do better because they're human beings, um, and this is true in all occupations. And so we need to change the narrative about schools in our society. We actually have world-class schools in Australia. They're called government schools, they're called Catholic schools, they're called independent schools, they're schools in other systems. We know we have world-class schools because our best education academics tell us so. And I'm talking about people like John Hattie, our best-known international education academic. And it doesn't do any good for the media and sometimes politicians to lash schools and pretend that schools are the reason for all of society's ills. Teachers, <laughs> teachers do... John. John, I just want to pick up on the point, though, that Emma made about the abuse that teachers receive, because you sent a newsletter to your school community uh, in 2018, and this is what you said. You said that you're having to interact with too many parents who have verbally abused, physically threatened or shouted at a staff member. Uh, you went on to say, I'm aware some parents, because they're paying fees, see the relationship with teachers as a master-servant relationship such that they are entitled to make extravagant demands. Why did you do that? I did that uh, ironically because at St Andrews Cathedral School there's hardly any problem at all with parents. And I wanted to keep it that way and so I got onto the front foot. And to my astonishment, my newsletter to these six to eight parents only in my school who were troublesome, after one month went viral internationally. <laughs> So it seemed to strike a chord, not just with schools and not just with independent schools, but with government school principals, with local council staff, with health workers, who gave me lots of feedback about the disappearance of much of the civility in society. And I take that to mean that we have a society which has stress and where people think it's satisfactory to lash out at others. And I was, in effect, standing against that. And I got uh, thanks from France, Brazil, uh, New Zealand. So it seems to be an international issue, um, particularly across the Western world, where people are responding in this way. And I want to say quite clearly that teachers should not be the target. I've been teaching for 48 years. So I've been a principal for 30. The number of teachers in any school government or independent that I've seen that aren't trying their hardest over nearly 50 years, I could count on the fingers of one hand. Okay. It is not satisfactory to attack teachers because the fightings are societal, they're not essentially educational. Uh, Tanya Plibersek, uh, problem parents, have you seen them? Are you one? <laughs> well, you'd, ha you'd have to ask my kids' teachers whether I am one. Um, no, I'll answer in two ways. As a parent, I think it's really important to back teachers. And I've got three kids. They're all very different. Uh, and um, uh, I do occasionally get a note home about the behaviour of one or more of my children. <laughs> and I don't ring the teacher and say, you're so wrong, you don't understand my child's brilliance. But you know I, that parents I speak, that do do that. I, I, I know. And it's complete... I, I think that's wrong. I think you should be reinforcing the standards that the school sets... Uh, for school behaviour at school at home with your kids. But what your um, que questioner was asking about was even one step beyond that, people who are verbally and physically abusive, never on, never OK. 
Absolutely, 100% not. But I think it goes to another question as well. A lot of teachers, particularly at the beginning of their careers, say that they don't feel well prepared for dealing with kids with behavioural issues in their classroom or kids with special learning needs in their classroom. And uh, I think making sure that our initial teacher training um, is strong in that area and that early career teachers have a lot of support uh, if they've got kids with behavioural issues in their classrooms is so important as well. It's important for the kids learning and it's important for the teacher and keeping those teachers in the classroom. Can I come in on the same issue, sure. if I may? John, if you wouldn't mind just waiting a moment, I, I want to bring in Dorothy Hodenot here because she was the principal of Holroyd High School for 23 years, I think. Yes. Uh, Dorothy, what do you make, having run a school, of John Collier's approach, telling the parents, right, this is too much, get back in the box? I, I don't think that was uh, an issue in a school like Holroyd, which was um, a disadvantaged school, where a lot of the parents didn't have any agency anyway in society or in their children's education. A lot of our parents couldn't speak English. And a lot of our parents, because they were refugees, uh, didn't have very much education themselves. And that's that, that's a, a, a basic issue for a lot of schools, that, that your parents can't really engage in a, in a powerful way with their children's education because they may have had little education themselves. And they're also quite... Uh, fearful and, and respectful of the school in one sense. So, so where does this sense of entitlement about how the school behaves come from? Well, I, I don't know. I, you, you'd have, which school are you talking about? <laughs> well, I think it depends very much. I, 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 there, were, there were times when I was very glad that we didn't have many middle-class parents in the school. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I think we all caught that look. That's the look <laughs> of, uh, of a school principal of 23 years. Uh, v, I want to hear your take on this, because you and your family have a, a particular view of how Australia treats teachers. Yes, yeah, so both my parents are Vietnamese refugees and especially my father, he came when he was my age, which was 17, 18, and he went through life and death situations to actually get to Australia. He came on a boat? Yeah, he was a boat refugee. And um, he and my mother grew up f with poverty, especially in Vietnam and especially just landing in Australia first go. And so they understood that education was a way to actually move past socioeconomic disparities and actually build yourself up from poverty. So I've really grown up with a respect for education because I know that in a lot of countries in the world and especially developing countries, they don't have the same opportunities that we do in Australia. And we need to stop taking it for granted and actually start realising that, yes, there are flaws and we need to reform it. And um, it has the potential to be um, a great um, world-class system, but I think that it really does have to come down to how students view teachers, how teachers themselves view themselves, and also how society views teachers. I do think that um, students do need to respect um, the, the education system. I think that if you don't respect them and you don't engage with the system, then you're not actually learning from it. And we're so lucky to be in a country like Australia, which we are offered education, and obviously it's not perfect, but at least we are offered education and an opportunity mm. to go to university. There's a lot of, like my parents in Vietnam, you don't, there's only so many people that actually get into university. And it's a tough competition there and in a lot of countries. And I think also teachers also need to be able to see, are they engaged and are they passionate and are they respecting also the student and not and encouraging them to potentially participate in discussions or raise questions and obviously not push them to the side and say, you're just a kid, you don't know anything because maybe they have something valuable to actually say. And I think we just need to work on respect in the education system, not just from one demographic, but as a whole in society. Is that something that, through policy, you can change? Uh, human behaviour is very difficult to change through um, government policy. Uh, <laughs> but what we're seeing... But, but what we're seeing, really, in schools is a reflection of what's happening in the other parts but of come the come on, I mean, we talk about this every week on Q&A. People come and turn up, young people particularly, and say, look at what our politicians do in Parliament. Well, look, away, I mean, look at the way they shout at each other. Go to weekend sport and have a look at how the referees are, are talked to. Listen to Talkback Radio. 
Listen to the way they talk to people who lost hundreds of thousands. <laughs> I've, 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 I've turned it off. Right? Yeah. I've turned it off, right? Because yeah. I mean, I, you know, this is a social ill. This is not a school ill. There's no class for being a jerk in in school. I mean, kids and parents are bringing this into the school, and they're learning it outside the school. And I guess right. No way should teachers have to put up with that. No one should put up with that in the work in the workplace for a start. Uh, and I and I'd say, if I was still the minister of education, I'd say, you know, when it's the, when it's appropriate, call the cops. Get the police involved because no one in the workplace, no one actually ever uh, deserves to put up with that kind of behaviour and there should be absolutely zero tolerance to it. But part of this is the hyper competitiveness now in schools, right? You know, I, I, my kid needs this in order to get that edge in, the, in year 12 or whatever it is. This hyper competitiveness throughout our society and our culture. School's an example, sport's another example. Do, do parents expect too much of the school? I know you have an issue with the amount of screen time kids yeah. have and the impact that has on them in the classroom. Is your message in part to parents, you've actually got to do more? Yeah, I mean, I, as a parent of a nine-year-old and a 12-year-old, you know, I'm, I'm afraid of what consequences there are for my children and, and screens. And, and we're pretty strict. My, my, parent, my kids are not great fans of me because we're really strict. <laughs> I mean, Good for no, you. I, I'm worried about it. I, I think we have the same knowledge about the impacts of screens as we had about cigarette smoking in the 30s. Mm. You know, are we going to look back in 50 years' time and say, hey, you know what, there were three-year-olds sitting in prams with, mm. with screens. Imagine doing that the same way we look back at our attitudes towards smoking. You know, the Marlboro man was cool. Today, Apple is cool. Are we going to, are we going to say in a, in, in a few decades' time, look at the mental health consequences? I mean, they are significant. We're, we're doing some work at, at UNSW through the Gonski Institute around screen time and the impacts that's having, having with some Canadian and researchers from Harvard about this correlation between all of these mental health consequences uh, and social consequences and the rise in, in screen use. And I've got to say, uh, you know, more work needs to be done, but uh, it's, it's not looking good. We don't know the ramifications it's, it's having. It's having, you know, it's a changing children's minds, changing their, the way their brains operate. Mm. Uh, and, and I think the consequences are really serious and a lot more work needs to be done. All right, our next question tonight comes from Finn McBride. Hi, I'm a Year 12 student at an independent boys' school. Uh, I've witnessed firsthand how a dangerous culture of sexism and misogyny can easily be promoted amongst students. Are boys at same-sex schools being prepared enough for the world outside Year 12? And what can I be doing as a student to be a better ally for women? Finn McCready with that question. I made up the surname. Uh, v, <laughs> what's your view on that? Uh, uh, is there this sort of toxic masculinity that we hear about, that we've seen in, in the news? Yeah, I definitely think that there is a culture of toxic masculinity. And I think one of the problems we have is that we give them this justification of, oh, boys will be boys, you know, like, that's just how they are. But we have to understand that the actions that arise are not acceptable. And it's not just about your gender, but it's about actually sometimes the crimes that they commit. So I'm so tired of hearing, you know, oh, it's just like, just let them be, they'll grow up. But if we don't teach them now but that what they're doing is wrong, then we can't actually tackle the problem when they all go out into the workplace and possibly contribute to workplace harassment. I know, you know, in the news that we see, obviously, in the recent case with the tram chants, that these usually private school boys, they feel like that they have the confidence and that they feel they have the courage, or oh, that's a positive word, but they have this audacity to say such things in public and then we see numerous incidences of sexual assault and sexual harassment of schoolboys showing you know their friends nudes without the girls um, actual consent or that they're taking pictures up girl skirts and we have to understand that it's not okay and I know that I'm lucky in lucky to have not faced that direct sexual harassment or assault but there shouldn't be a lucky one. There shouldn't be a fortunate person. A woman shouldn't have to feel like they're unsafe in their own school environment. And I shouldn't have to sit in a class or sit with my peers and think, there is a girl here that has been sexually harassed or even assaulted. And we need to start holding these students accountable. And also, we need to stop thinking that what we're doing currently is enough because we see 
after incident and after incident that what we're doing isn't enough. I think suspensions personally, you know, on paper to the school it might look like a serious consequence, but actually try and think it back to the victim or to the perpetrator. To the perpetrator, potentially a few days off school is, you know, hooray, I get school off um, days off school and, you know, I'll just move on from that and I'll just live my life and not actually learn my lesson. And then the victim sitting there, you know, being traumatised and is going to impact their entire life and they're thinking how can how can they just get away with it and we need to start holding not only schools but also students accountable for the actions and consequences that they impact upon students I, I, I mean, there is a great deal of accountability for public schools but you want greater accountability for the private schools which receive public funding explain yeah I, look I, I think um, you know there's this whole argument about funding and um, We're going to get to that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, but I do think that public schools are, are held... Di are treated differently to, to non-government schools, particularly around this issue of, of, account of accountability. I mean, public schools have to record critical incidents. Um, non-government schools record them, but um, they're not necessarily made, made public, whereas in public schools they, they certainly are. And I think in exchange for public funding, uh, any school that gets public funding, whether they be a public school, a Catholic school or an independent school, should be under those same rules of, of accountability and transparency, including how the money should be spent, <laughs> how the money is how the money is allocated, even to, to non-government schools, particularly within non-government school systems. Just comment on that one, Hamish. Sure, but I just want to pick up though on that because uh, I noted you had mentioned the paperwork that the Catholic school system had to comply with in order to get. $800 million worth of funding from your state when you were the yep. Education Minister. How much paperwork did they have to do? It was, it was one page. The page the, what I saw when I asked the Department for a brief was it was one page. I'm now, now for, for a $600 million cheque, that's not enough. If you apply for a $30,000 grant for Scouts, you have to do a lot more than that. <laughs> so it wasn't about accusing anybody of doing the wrong thing, but the accountability and the transparency needs to be equal. That way you don't see the, the incidents... Well, less chance of seeing the incidents like we saw in, in Melbourne where, where things can happen in some schools but there's no transparency around, unless police get involved or, mm. or somebody finds out about it. John Collier. I don't think it's true that there's a lack of accountability in independent schools. In fact, we are overwhelmed with accountability. We're tied up in red tape and compliance and I spent much of my time, as do my finance people in an independent school, equipping reports to government. Uh, there are about a whole raft of things, student welfare, curriculum, examinations, funding. We report to NESA in New South Wales. We report to the state government. We report to the federal government. Uh, it's simply not the case that we are unaccountable. We are massively accountable. And I have no problem with accountability. My issue is whether all of the raft of paperwork which takes teachers away from their primary task of teaching is actually necessary and justified. And this is a broader issue than what we're discussing right now because the accountability and compliance requirements affect teachers in all sectors and actually take them away from the frontline tasks of teaching and pastoring students. Okay. So I'm not sure that the benefit from that is proportional to the amount of time spent. Uh, Hamish, do you mind if we go back to Finn's question just for a second? Because um, he asked two things, like what can we do to change this culture? And I think um, we have had some really effective respectful relationships programs in schools. Uh, I don't think they're widespread enough. It's now in the curriculum, but I, I, I reckon if there's young people in the audience, how many of you feel like you've had effective respectful relationships education so far at school? Yeah, like not a hand's going up for the studio <laughs> for those viewers at home. <laughs> um, and and I, I, so I do think from a very early age there are great models that teach people about, uh, you know, age appropriate, how to negotiate respectful relationships, how to have healthy friendships uh, as time goes on, how to have healthy sexual relationships as well. Uh, we need to do better. I, I know that the, the teachers will say, oh, I've got one more thing in the curriculum. I, I get that, but this is so fundamental. If it's only being taught at home, uh, at school, and what you're seeing at home is completely contrary to that, then 
what happens at school isn't going to counteract mm. that. So we have to go well beyond what's happening in schools to what's happening in families, society, community. Adrian was talking about before sporting organisations, politicians have to lead uh, as well to say that um, violence and sexism are never OK, not ever, not in any context, ever. Um, but you said... Um, you also said, what can you do to be a better ally? I think the fact you've asked the question has kind of answered that. You obviously already are. But, but I do have a message for young men. Like, quite often, you will be in a group and things could go one way or the other. You know, someone's vulnerable, someone's on their own, um, someone's about to be bullied, someone's about to be assaulted, harassed. You have to be the leader in that group. And it's hard, it's embarrassing. People think you're, you, you know, straighty 180, whatever. You be that leader. And, um, and that culture change that you do amongst your peers is so much more powerful than me talking about it on television or your teachers or your parents. <laughs> so be the leader in your peer group. All right. Our next question tonight comes from Jim Alchin. Culture and tradition are key aspects of St Joseph's College, the school that I attend. How do we ensure that strong traditions stay intact without a backwards culture developing in our schools? OK, Eddie Wu, I want to put this to you because you work in the public system, mm -hmm. but you are of Christian faith, strongly mm -hmm. of Christian faith. What do you think is the value of tradition and faith in the education system? Mm. Tradition and faith have immense value and I think it's a wonderful thing that we have diversity within the Australian school system. I think it's one of the um, great things that we can prize and that we can treasure. Um, you spoke before about the, the, the sort of worry about being backwards whilst prizing tradition and I think it's, while it's not easy to do, it's easy to identify how to avoid that problem and that's to say, why did these traditions come about? Why, why does my faith, which is ancient, centuries old, what does it actually stand for as opposed to things that we say, things that we follow, patterns and rituals that we kind of have lost the meaning of. Um, and there are modern examples of this as well. I'm delighted, for example, that now, as opposed to when I was at school, it's a standard practice in a New South Wales public school to have an acknowledgement of country when you can't have a welcome to country. And that's fantastic. We've, we've been far too long in waiting to bring that about. But at the same time, and I've seen it, dozens, scores of times, that that itself, even though it is a newer recognised thing, simply becomes a script that we read off. And even though it's not old within our schools, it's become that same backward-looking, doesn't have a sense of the meaning of why it's important that we recognise the traditional custodians of the land. So I think it's about fastening on the meaning of the things that we do. And sometimes that means you have to shatter something old that has lost that meaning because culture and society are moving in that way and it takes courage to ask those questions like e you did. Eddie, some of the problems that have been described by both Adrian and Tanya are to do with society as a whole drifting away from principles. I mean, is that something in your view that faith can play a role in within the education system? This is a really interesting question to pose to me because as a public school teacher, you know, the mantra of public education is it is free, compulsory and secular. But at the same time, one of the great things about its secularity is that it makes room for people of all faiths, of all belief systems, of all convictions. So one of the things that I think really matters is that we look at all those different individuals, all the different cultures that make Australia a beautiful place and we can't deny that. I know mean, there's been a big conversation around multiculturalism when I was, you know, at school, when I was your age. This is a conversation which I felt very ill-equipped to actually have compared to today. Um, we need to be able to make space for that conversation to happen. And this comes back to Finn's question before. Um, sexism, racism, like I faced when I was younger, this is something which is at the heart of every single human being. It's not new. Um, and it's not something which we've moved on from. Every generation needs to learn afresh how to give respect to those of different cultures, those of different identities. John, Co John Collier, <laughs> this clearly is something that Australia as a whole doesn't have an answer to. And perhaps the themes that he's talking about are playing out more broadly. The, the contest between tradition and adapting culturally. I think the best schools have a respect for tradition but present an eclectic 
mix of time-honoured educational success and the best of current research. And that seems to me to be the way to go. And I could be talking about an independent school uh, the way it is just talked about the government sector. That is to say, most independent schools are not enclaves. They represent the same microcosm of society with the same diversity. And even though they may have a particular faith commitment, they show respect for other commitments and no faith commitment. That's certainly a description of my school, where it is multicultural. And one of the best things that was said to me last year by a departing Year 12 students who came across the stage is, thank you so very much for making me a Muslim welcome for these six years in this Anglican school. And I was delighted to hear that, because that's the kind of inclusive approach we need in a multicultural, multi-faith society where we express respect. How important is discipline? Discipline's very important, because without discipline, we can't have order, and without order, we can't have proper focus on teaching and learning. And that's what teachers do, and that's what schools are essentially about. Um, so it matters. Um, I think that, yes, there should be a respect towards, you know, the system and discipline, but I also think that that can have potential to be abused, and I think that um, it's... Sometimes you have to think, OK, a teacher might be right, but there are, they're still human and they might be wrong, and we have seen cases where teachers have um, abused students or, you know, administration has not listened to students. So I think that while we do have a respect for discipline and we do have to respect kind of order and hierarchy in institutions like schools, that we still engage and listen with the students because they are ultimately the ones who are impacted the most by this discipline and by rules. And perhaps they have something to give to the table and that they actually have a genuine experience that might impact the way that you look to discipline students. Can I go to this question? Um, I, you're on the on the verge of adulthood, right? And a big part of your education till now has been to teach you to tell the difference between right and wrong, your education at home and your education at school. And I, I think um, I think you could answer your own question when you're confronted with a, a problem. We see some very positive traditions that bind groups together in a way that is inclusive and healthy, and we see some very negative ones. You only need to look at the hazing rituals at some of the colleges at universities that leave people drunk or in hospital or sexually assaulted or whatever else to know that that's a tradition, but it's not one that anyone should be continuing. Uh, I, think, um, I think equipping people to make their own decisions about what are positive rituals or values in an organisation and what you should be fighting to change uh, is a really important part of education. All right, our next question tonight comes from Jin Xiang. Uh, my question is for uh, Mr Eddie Wu. And when my children moved to Sydney from Shanghai in January 2019, they were disappointed to find out the class math was uh, one or two years behind what they learned in Shanghai. So what do you think needs to be done in Australia to improve the standard of math teaching? Mm. Thank Eddie you. Wu, that chimes pretty neatly with the PISA result findings, the Program for International School Assessment, which showed Australian students are now more than three and a half years behind these, their Chinese peers when it comes to, to maths. Mm. How much time do you have, Jingshan? <laughs> um, there are so many differences between, obviously, the Australian education system as a whole and what's happening in Shanghai. And, you know, your reference to PISA results, Hamish, is also telling because this has been something which we've tracked um, year on year on year. Every, um, you know, three to four years when this comes out, we've seen a fairly consistent trend and it's absolutely concerning. Action has to be taken. Um, it's really important to note that um, there's a huge difference. This is going to the conversation we had before about the culture of schools and the place of education in Australia as opposed to a place like Shanghai. For example, um, when I go to school and when I teach, the number of hours that I actually spend face-to-face -face with my students 
versus the number of hours that a teacher from Shanghai spends face-to-face -face with students focused on teaching and learning, vastly different. Um, there's also a huge difference in when we have a look at the numbers on who's actually standing in front of classrooms. Um, I got a mathematics degree when I went to train to become a teacher, and that makes me really fortunate to have had the opportunity, like B was talking about, as someone who his parents came to this country so I could have that opportunity. But it's pretty clear that the data doesn't uh, make any sort of uh, illusion about this, that not every student around Australia gets that same experience. Uh, when we have a look in high schools where we need specialist teachers as opposed to in primary where we have generalists, on average we actually have only about 60% of our students from year 7 to 10 with a teacher who has a maths degree, who is qualified and has more than just a willingness to teach that subject, someone who has trained to become a maths teacher over their time there. Now, 60% sounds like a pretty low number. It is, but it actually gets worse than that because that's over four years. So I'm eyeballing this, you know, uh, let's say about 200 people here in this room. So you're year seven tonight. Of you, 120 of you, um, putting the line about here. Everyone to this side, 120 of you get the maths teacher in year seven. Good for you, that's nice for year seven, but then that happens again in year eight, only 60% of that group. And then by year nine, 60% of that group. By the end of year 10, after four years, there's only gonna be, oh, I'm doing numbers live on here, that's a bad idea. There's only gonna be about 27 <laughs> students in the room who had a maths teacher all the way through those four years. Why are we surprised that by the time students hit 15, which is when they're assessed on PISA, they're right in the thick of experiencing either fantastic mathematics teaching all that way, or an interrupted experience of that? That accounts for a lot of the differences that we see within the systems. Adrian Piccoli, over a decade and a half, it's clear the trajectory is down when it comes to maths specifically. At the same time, we've had all of these reforms, the Gonski reforms, both versions. What have we done wrong? Well, I think it's important to say that we we still have a, a very good education system in Australia. I mean, we do. it's right to focus on what needs to be improved, but I think it's always important to say um, the things that we do right. We, we know how to deliver a world-class education uh, to students in Australia, and we do, just not, as Eddie said, not to every student, and that's the problem. You but could drive... but, but, the, but the, the line goes directly down, and yeah. it's been going down for about 16 years, yep. uh, according to the PISA results, at the same time as all of these reforms that are supposed to make the system better yep. and which have brought about more funding than ever before. Wow. Yeah. And, so and, and look, why is that? that? <laughs> and the, the, but the interesting trend also is that it's every state is trending the same way. Every sector, government, Catholic, independent, are trending the same way. Um, uh, across just about every demographic. I mean, high-performing students are performing uh, worse, low-performing students are performing worse. I mean, the trend is uniform. When you look at those PISA results in, their, in detail, the trend is uniform, which actually says to me there is something more cultural, national going on here in terms of our performance, because different states do different things, different sectors do different things. You might actually think that the trend would be a little bit different. One would be going up, one would be going down. They're all trending in the same direction. Can I ask you, though, because when you were the Education Minister in New South Wales, you made some really significant cuts. I think it was 2012. Uh, $1.7 billion worth of cuts. total of 1,800 jobs were cut. Do you look at that decision now and think, well, yeah, that's why we've ended up with these sorts of <laughs> results? Oh, look, you know, nice try, Hamish. <laughs> Seriously, I mean... You must reflect on some of those decisions and ask if part of that is causing this. Oh, look, n n not at all. I mean, we, we made the decisions we had to make at the time and, and actually we then had the opportunity to actually put it all back plus more um, when we invested or when we co-invested with the Commonwealth in Gonski funding. So New South Wales schools, all sectors, government, independent and Catholic, are far better off funding-wise now than they were uh, eight years ago when, when all of this happened. So... Um, but, but if you take $200 million out of public schooling, as you did... Well, we, uh, we didn't. It, it has impacts. We, did, we didn't. We didn't. It's, it's all... No, none of it was inside the school gate, right? None of it was inside the school gate. But then what we were able to do, as a result of the things that we did around, you know, reducing the bureaucracy, etc., we are actually able to co-invest with the Commonwealth on a two-thirds, one-third basis. We put in a third, Commonwealth put in two-thirds. And all school sectors in New South Wales now are substantially better off 
than they were eight years ago. Now, had we not done that, we wouldn't have been able to afford to do make those kinds of investments. But all parts of the New South Wales government at the time made those savings so that we actually could invest it in education, which is what we did. Can, can I jump in on the funding question? Um, New South Wales was the first state to sign up to the, the Gonski reforms. And uh, what happened after that... Um, in You're talking about the original way... The original ones. Introduced the, by back, back in the Labor. good old days, yeah. Um, <laughs> what happened in 2014 in that first horror budget of Tony Abbott's and, and Joe Hockey's was that the signed agreements that all of the, well, most of the states and territories had with the Commonwealth were thrown out the window and $30 billion of future funding was taken out of education. So it's, you know, by all means, give Adrian a hard time tonight. <laughs> but it is telling that the Federal Education Minister isn't here tonight to answer the same question about the massive Federal Government cuts to education. Can we be clear, though, what you mean by Federal Government cuts? Because you've been picked up on it a number of times. You went to the last election claiming $14 uh, billion worth of cuts uh, made by this Government. But that, that was actually in comparison to what you were promising. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's in comparison to what the states and territories signed up for, what they were promised, what not... I don't care about the government being promised it. I care about kids being promised it. Schools were expecting uh, but, but it wasn't this a extra cut by funding. this government on their own uh, policy. It was a, no, a cut it was, as opposed to what so, you would have introduced. So it was... Uh, the first cut in 2014... Um, was $30 billion, and that was the difference over 10 years between what the Liberals funded schools and what they would have got under the signed agreements and arrangements that were already in place under the former Labor government. John Collier. I want to agree with Eddie that there are problems with appropriate teacher supply, and I want to partially agree with Adrian and Tanya. Uh, you, and what I want to say... You know they're from different sides of I politics. Do, yeah. I, do. I want to talk about PISA for a moment and say that the results in PISA are very stratified and a simplistic analysis will not cut the mustard. For instance, in PISA, the independent schools in New South Wales were respectively third in the world in the OCED uh, literacy tests, fourth in science and eighth in mathematics. Now, where's the problem? The problem that we have in Australia is essentially an equity problem. That is to say that students who need support, whether they be in government schools or the poorer Catholic or independent schools, are not getting the government support that they need. And so funding... <laughs> funding needs to be targeted, just, not just looked at at a quantum. Further, I'd say we're asking the wrong question about PISA. If people are saying education is failing because there are some PISA score problems, I'm saying you can't measure education by a small sample test of Year 9 students which doesn't actually test the Australian curriculum. <laughs> John, I'm, I'm just going to interrupt you there because you've, you've raised the question of equity and we've actually got a ton of questions on equity tonight from various students in our audience. We're going to meet a couple of them just now. Ruby, you're in Year 7, I think, at Randwick Girls Hide. You're oh. very small sitting down, so do you want to stand up? Yeah. Uh, that'll make this easier. You've seen your own school, but you've also seen other schools, some private schools. How do they compare? Well, the, um, my school, it's amazing, but there's, like, a lot of cosmetic issues. There's... The whole school is made of concrete and it's just bare exposed concrete. There's... A lot of the classrooms are ill-equipped for modern learning and barely any of them have aircon. But I went to Skeggs and... <laughs> Sorry, I wasn't meant to say Skeggs, but anyway... <laughs> Another school. Um... <laughs> this is a private school. You went to have a look there. How did yeah. it compare? Uh, it was... Incredible, like the grounds were huge and it was so beautiful and everything was shiny. They even had like a life size skeleton with like organs and everything. And I just couldn't understand why schools like that are getting funding over schools like mine. Okay, and you were. What... <laughs> Before I leave you, what do you want to be when you grow up? I want to be the Prime Minister of Australia. Okay, there we go. Yeah. Uh... <laughs> Emily, uh, would you like to stand up as well? You've moved to Sydney from Griffith in regional New South Wales. Uh, compare the schooling experience there with uh, the Big Smoke. What stands out in particular about the comparison in private school schooling here and public school schooling in um, rural New South Wales 
is that there is a clear disparity between the resources, the facilities and the outside of school educational opportunities. So for myself, I was unable to access debating competitions because of the area I lived in and because of my location. And so for me, that raised the question of not why did I want to go to a private school, but rather how can I further my educational opportunities? And it's things like being here tonight and being able to be part of the discussion and debate, which prove that rural students are not able to access these things. And despite what's being done in terms of Gonski and Aurora College, which I know was Adrian's initiative, there's still no other rural students here. And I would like to see in the future so many more who are able to attend and able to have these educational opportunities. Okay. <laughs> Obviously, a huge number of questions on this tonight. You're the school captain at Cheltenham. That's uh, Eloise, what's your question? Um, so I go to a public school and I see many non-government schools that have uh, Olympic-sized indoor swimming pools and world-class theatres and baronial-style libraries. And I see that they, sh they don't need public funding but I still see them getting a lot of resources and funding from the government. And at the same time, I see schools and public schools like my own that are sometimes not able to give basic learning resources like textbooks because we simply do not have enough. How is this fair? And why are we funding privilege, not educational outcomes? Okay. <laughs> Adrian, particularly, I'm gonna put this to you. Uh, is this what the Gonski reforms were all about? Well, the Gonski reforms were actually about were about needs-based funding. So, um, you know, so schools know. resourcing standard, you know, it's quite technical, but every student gets funded based on, on need. And then if you had a particular characteristic, a, a particular disadvantaged characteristic, that there would be extra funding and then that funding would go whether, whichever school you went to. So, needs-based funding delivers funding to, to students uh, um, who need it. Now, there are existing disparities around this school resourcing standard, who's above it, who's below it, and there are all these transition periods. So, you know, it's, it's, it's complicated. But so the system has the, it's gotten better. Before you go it's on, not, though... It's not fixed. Because the Australian Curriculum Assessment and Reporting Authority says actually that over the past decade, public funding to private schools has risen nearly twice as fast as public funding to public schools. Mm -hmm. That's not quite what you're saying. Well, I mean, I'm not here to defend the Commonwealth Government, either <laughs> the current one or the previous one. <laughs> right, that's not my job here. Uh, the New South Wales Government that I was um, a part of, uh, we certainly did increase the amount of money that we spent on public schools. And the reason we signed up to Gonski particularly is because when I saw the numbers as Minister about which schools would benefit the most, the ones who benefited the most were Country schools, regional and remote schools, huge beneficiaries. Small the schools. second biggest beneficiaries were Western and Southwestern Sydney. And the, the ones who benefited the, the, the least were the ones you would expect to benefit the, the least. That's why we signed up for it. That's why we took the measures we took to make sure that we could invest in it. And, and I think, there, look, funding is not fixed by any stretch of the imagination, but it is much better than it was 10 years ago. And I've got to say, Simon. Um, Simon Birmingham and uh, Malcolm Turnbull fixed it um, again a little bit by reducing some of the, the overfunded so non-government schools. 2 is that what yeah, they, they reduced the funding that was going, the overfunding that was going to some non-government schools. So you know, I've got to give them credit as well. It's far from fixed, um, but it is an improvement on what it was. Can, can I just I jump think in Eddie here? Eddie Wu wanted to jump in here. Do, oh. It's just about the formula, though. Can I just add something to the formula sure. super quickly? Um, so, so Adrian's described the schooling resource standard, blah, blah, blah. Let's just call that a school's fair funding level, OK? What the Commonwealth Government has now done is said that every non-government school by 2023 will get to 100% or more of their fair funding level, but public schools will only ever get to 95% of their fair funding level. That's in the formula. That's baked in. That, that inequality is now baked in based on the arrangements that the Commonwealth Government's made with the states and territories, that, that's at the heart of the unfairness. So, so to be specific, how would you fix it? How would you change well, it? Well, all government? schools should get to 100% of their, their fair funding level so, so over how time. Would you, where would you find the money from? Well, you have to do these things over time. You have to... Uh, at the moment, um, by 2023, every non-government school will be at 100% or more, 
and no public school will ever get there. No, sorry, 99% of public schools will never get there but under you, this funding model. Would you model. then change the process through which independent schools are adjusted? Well, I'm, because... I'm not going to. I'm not going to make up a funding model on TV on your show tonight. Sure, but you'd be, fam <laughs> but you'd be familiar with the arguments it, it about is... doing it based on postcodes versus uh, the actual but, income of the parents. But, no, that actually is irrelevant to this. I think that's a fairer measure, taking a parent's actual income is a fairer measure, but that's not the question here. The question is, do we get all schools to their fair funding level, or is it OK that public schools never get there under this model? So, so I can't give you a free pass on this. <laughs> Will you have a policy for fixing that by the next election? Well, we've got two years till the next election, and last our, our last uh, education policy had $14 billion extra for public schools. Okay, Eddie Brew. Really briefly, I just think it needs to be added onto this conversation because I think that we often get sort of caught in the morass of funding and numbers and just from that classroom teacher perspective again, and Adrian knows this, he's from, he's from Griffith, and when I get the opportunity, which is really a privilege for me to work with teachers in regional, rural and remote areas, it really needs to be said that money on its own doesn't fix the problem. Mm. But every school's resource allocation model, which is it's true if for, for very small schools um, and for ones with socio-educational disadvantage, get this extra loading. But when you go out to Griffith, to those teachers who get given lots of money for professional learning, they still can't access it for at least two reasons. Number one, they need to get on a plane <laughs> To come to Sydney or another metropolitan centre, stay there for a night, then come back. So actually, ironically, we, we've seen this issue with toilet paper recently. For someone <laughs> like me, who lives in the metro area, it is, when you can get it, so much cheaper to actually access those kinds of resources in the teaching space for professional learning than someone in a regional area. And then there's the second part, which is that three-day round trip there isn't a teacher in Griffith to replace that person. So it just needs to be recognised this is a far more complex picture than just throwing money in different directions. We need to actually knuckle down and see how we're going to address these issues at a personal level. John. I'm very sympathetic to the point of view from the student from Randwick and the student from Cheltenham. I'm a working class boy by background. I went to government schools as a student. I worked in the public sector for 25 years. I was a government school principal. My grandchildren go to government schools. My son-in-law teaches in the government school. My answer to this is that funding needs to be sector blind, needs based. That's what Gonsi was supposed to be. <laughs> the, problem, the problem is that Gonsi has been politicised Tanya blamed the Abbott government. I'm happy with that. But, <laughs> but I, also, I also blame the Gillard government because, you see, I was there at the original Gonski release when Gonski asked for $5 billion and the Prime Minister said there's no more money. And so Gonski was a forlorn figure from the beginning with his legs cut from under him. And Gonski didn't recognise what Gonski became. There's a lot of misunderstanding about funding in federalism, which is part of our problem with the buck passing between states and federal. The federal government basically funds non-government schools and the state government basically funds government schools. That's confusing. If we can actually have needs-based funding without special deals for interest groups, we will be a lot better off in this society. What do you mean by that? I mean that various lobby groups from within education from particular sectors can threaten governments that they will campaign in marginal electorates and this can influence government policy. Can you give us an example of that? Well, we all know the example because it's in the public domain. There was a great deal of uh, politicking by Catholic education in Victoria before the last federal election. and. The Catholic sector is perhaps not as starved of funds as they might have otherwise been. And I think that's <laughs> in the public domain. And we need to actually fund on the basis of need and not on the basis of politics. What do you make of the, the reasons, the explanations 
for this funding disparity? I think we're talking quite big, so we're talking about policies and legislations, but we have to listen to students, and the students here have definitely made a great point, and I've witnessed it myself. Macrob is not a private school. We are a government school, and we don't have ovals, we don't have swimming pools, and we have collapsing ceilings, and it's not fair when I go to a debating competition in a really affluent school that has all of these big ovals to the point where they have a separate campus for their sports facilities. And then I look at definitely there's other public schools that are worse off than Macrob where they don't they go in mobile classrooms with no air conditioning, with no heating, they're cramped, they don't they can't even run certain subjects because of the amount of funding. So why is there still funding going to schools with Olympic sized moving decks or they still have all of these campuses when they don't need funding and there's so many other schools, especially the students that have raised their concerns, they actually need the funding. So it's not about, you know, the big, obviously it's a big picture, but we have to look at, you know, the certain schools that are actually impacted and what students are saying. It's not, it's not enough to say, oh, yeah, we're doing enough, when evidently now it's not enough, that there are schools who are suffering, there are schools that are obviously doing well because of how much funding they're getting, and you see it in everywhere. So, for example, in debating, um, in DAV, we see a lot of the top kind of private all-boys schools really dominating the rankings, and a lot of the time it's because they can afford these adjudicators and these coaches that can train them and give them resources and their schools can supply actual classrooms to debate in. And then public schools are actually left without any of that. And Have they come just... up against you yet, V? <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> but it's just unfair to see just schools doing well because they were lucky enough to be born in an affluent family. And the government needs to take care of students actually going to public schools, which is the majority, and see how we can help them instead of just prioritising the rich minority. Right. Can I have uh, a quick disclaimer? Uh, a quick disclaimer? A quick disclaimer. Uh, I would love uh, in my independent school, St Andrews Cathedral School, to have a swimming pool or an oval. <laughs> um, we don't have those things. Uh, we don't have a tree line drive. Uh, we don't have a drive. We don't have a tree. <laughs> uh, so just bear in mind that the average independent school in Australia is not a wealthy school. Uh, most independent schools in Australia have an SES of 103 or less, and so the schools that we're talking about are the top 1% of independent schools. And I understand the point he is making, but do not think that's the whole sector. It's certainly not. John, can I ask you, though, if Australia's four richest schools spent more on new facilities and renovations than the poorest 1,800... Yes. Does that tell you that something about the way public funds are allocated to independent schools it, is wrong? It actually tells you, uh, in essence, how much money those schools can raise. I've looked up the figures and one-thirtieth of the capital works in independent schools are actually funded by government. One-thirtieth. The rest is actually raised by parent contributions and by bank loans. So. Bear in mind that the schools that we're talking about, the elite schools, get very, very little government funding. Uh, people don't understand there's a sliding scale and the greater the wealth of the parent community, the less funds schools get. And so some independent schools get very little funds. In my own school, which is, as I say, not a top-tier school, 85% of the funds to run the budget are from parents' fees. Okay. And the rest of it is the rest. There's government funds in there, certainly. There's also donations, there's fundraising, there's all kinds of things. So it's not a straightforward picture, as sometimes simplistic media coverage might make us think. Well, we've given it an hour tonight. I think that's <laughs> a fair amount. Uh, Louise Cachel has our next question. Hi. Um, if Australia truly cares to lift education standards and results, focus must be given to all students, not just those who are easy to teach. Students with disabilities represent at least 10% of the student population and yet they are pushed out of schools via suspensions, bullying and exclusion, being sent to behaviour schools. Why don't these students matter? Why are they treated this way and when will this discrimination stop? And Louise, can you just share with the panel your experience? Well, I, I represent um, a group of students, students with ADHD, 
which is a disability. 7% of the student population have ADHD and they are experiencing all of these exclusions, suspensions at alarming rates uh, and not accessing their education at the same rate as their peers, which is discrimination in education. Adrian Pickley. Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a really tricky question because I think everybody involved in, in education, teachers, administration, are, are, are really focused on, on, on trying to deliver the best education for all students um, and, and particularly students with disabilities. It's not always easy. Some schools do it better than others. Uh, looking at alternative ways to deal with um, some of the challenges um, with students with disabilities. I mean, suspension is, is, is never really a good solution for any student um, because, as somebody said before, uh, I mean, just excluding students from school doesn't actually serve their purpose. It gives the school, um, for whatever reason the suspension occurred, um, separation from the student, but it's not in the, in the student's best interest. You've been looking at models all over the world for solving problems right across education systems. Have you seen anywhere that is doing this, getting this particular component of the education system right? I, I think all systems keep working at it, doesn't matter how good they are, mm. because, it, because it, it's the nature of people involved in education. They actually are the most caring, community, caring group of people uh, in, our, in our community. I mean, people don't get into education for the money. They're getting it because they because they love it. They that's, love children. That's definitely true. <laughs> <laughs> they love children. <laughs> and you, when you hear an account like that, I mean, do ideas spring to your mind about how this can be done better? Um, before ideas spring up, um, emotions spring up. I mean, it's just it's heartbreaking to hear Louise, and I know that's um, Cherrybrook Technology High School where I teach. It includes so many students with a wide variety of disabilities, and that's really challenging. As Adrian points out, um, a lot of the teachers who are trying their best ha still have a long way to go, but in many ways, you know, we're kind of in the situation of making bricks without straw a little bit. Um, I think it's fantastic. We have so much more access now, even compared to, like it was, you know, in the grand scheme of things, a very short amount of time ago, 12 years ago when I started teaching, we have so much better access to information and relevant details to individual students' learning. And yet, when we think about uh, the 150 students that a regular high school teacher is going to teach, and many teach actually several more than that, um, it's an enormous challenge and very little support is often given. Um, at a school like Cherrybrook, we're really fortunate to have a great learning support team um, and student learning support officers who often come into our classes and provide us with that very focused, here's, here's what this particular student can really benefit from. But I know that's a benefit that comes largely from scale and so many schools out there, that particular student learning support officer or learning um, support teacher, they share with a lot of different schools. That's situation normal across New South Wales. So we have a long way to go in providing that additional support to teachers who want to absolutely do the very best for every student and just need the knowledge and the time to implement what actually helps. I, I can tell you it's not happening, it's not happening uh, in the broader mm. school education community. Uh, one in four children with ADHD are suspended from school on average four times each. 40% of those are aged four to seven years old, mm. are tiny children. They're treated like naughty children that no one wants. Mm. The teachers are not equipped, they're not trained, they're not provided with training. There is no training for teachers, they're not trained at when they're at university. And so these students are um, starting school and the message to them is you're bad, you're naughty, you're out. And they're being suspended multiple times. They're going to these behaviour schools and they're being sent there. And it's not a solution, it's not working. Mm. There are countries where in, uh, inclusive education does work and is happening, Canada, Italy, um, and those students there with autism, ADHD, these sort of neurological conditions where they have these behaviours, are able to access an inclusive education where they are wanted, adjusted for and al allowed to access their education without being shunned and pushed out. We really appreciate your time tonight, Louise. Thank, thank, thank you. you very much. Well, that is all we have time for tonight. Uh, would you please thank our wonderful panel, V Tran, John Collier, Eddie Wu, Tanya Plibersek, and Adrian Pickett. <laughs> and thanks to all of you for turning up so late on a school night. Next week, we're live in Melbourne talking about the Corona Challenge. Is Australia ready to deal with another crisis and its impact on all of us? Join us then. Have a very good night.